titled The Insignificant Characterization of Olifenulic Compounds as Potential Cyclobsidinous Modulators Part 1. So again, today I'll be telling you through the concept of cyclobsidinase and non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. So cyclobsidinase is an enzyme responsible for the conversion of alkylonic acid into different prostaglandins. There are two isoforms of cyclooxygenase, constitutive COX-1 and inducible COX-2. So cyclooxygenase 1 is responsible for the production of prostaglandins that are involved in various physiological functions, whereas uh, COX-2 is inducible, meaning that it is not always produced. It is only produced during inflammation. So these two enzymes are very similar and they share 60% se se sequence similarity. So non-steroidal and inflammatory drugs are currently used for the treatment of various ailments, including inflammation and pain. So these drugs work by inhibiting the activity of cyclooxygenase enzymes and thereby blocking the production of prostaglandins that are implicated in pain and inflammation. However, the long-term usage of these drugs can result in deleterious side effects such as the cardiovascular events as well as the gastrointestinal complication. So there is a pressing need for the development of alternative therapies with a specific interest in naturally derived compounds. So this study uh, demonstrated the use of compounds that are derived from a plant species known as uh, Ola europea, which is a plant species responsible for the production of olive oil. It has also has been demonstrated that the compounds from, found within this plant species possess um, a high phenolic uh, uh, compounds content with anti-inflammatory and antioxidant activities. Therefore, this study aims to identify the potential use of compounds derived from Ola europea as the uh, inhibitors of cyclooxygenase and Zalmuzi in silico studies. So it was hypothesized from this study that the olive-derived compounds provide a viable basis for the development of anti-inflammatory drugs. So to achieve the main goal of this study, firstly, an olive net library was curated for the identification of metabolites found within the olive oil, and then um, the human structure of COX-1 enzyme was then modeled using a software known as Modella 9.16 through a method known as homology modeling. So homology modeling is also known as comparative modeling, and is used to determine the pre structure of proteins based on the name structure, which is also known as the template or the reference. So on the other hand, the crystal structure of COX-2 enzyme was retrieved from PDB, which is protein data bank, eliminating the need for homology modeling. So molecular dynamic simulations, as you can see here, it was performed to investigate the binding affinities that occur between the compounds as well as the target proteins. So molecular docking was done using a software known as Quantum Mechanics Polarized Ligand Docking, which is abbreviated as QMPLD. So molecular dynamic simulation was then uh, employed in order to investigate the dynamics or the conformational changes that occur when the ligand is interacting with the target proteins. And this was done using a software known as Gromax 4.6.5. So the pair residue energy decomposition analysis was then performed in order to investigate the key residues that contribute to the binding of the ligands with the protein. And this was done, can you go back? So this was done in order to investigate the key residues that contribute to the ligand interacting with the target enzymes. So the software that was used here is known as Molecular Mechanics Poisman Boltzmann Surface Area. So this structure here is showing you the homology model of human COX-1, just like I was saying that it was um, it was done or performed using uh, comparative modeling or homology modeling. So the red color that you are seeing here is representing the EG as like domain, which is also known as the epidemial growth factor, and it is responsible for cell proliferation as well as for cell uh, differentiation. So the green color here is representing the membrane binding domain, 
which is known to bind to the structure of the endoplasmatic reticulum. Hence, they say that Cyclops one is found within the endoplasmatic reticulum. And it plays an important role in the localization as well as in the function of the cyclooxygenase enzyme, particularly COX-1. So the orange color here is showing you the surface representation of the specific residues that are going to go to contribute to the interaction between the ligand and the protein. And the blue color is showing you the peroxidase site. So remember, cyclooxygenase enzyme has two sites. We have the COX site as well as the COX site, which is the peroxidase site. So the COX site is responsible for the release of the alkidonic acid into, I mean, from the membrane phospholipids. Whereas the peroxidase site is responsible for the conversion of that alkidonic acid into different prostaglandins that are implicated in inflammation, pain, and fever. So this is the supplementary uh, data because I wanted to show you how the olive net library looks like. So as you can see, this library was um, it was done from the uh, I mean it was done in order to identify the compounds that are associated with the earlier European species. And as you can see, I'm not sure if you can be able to see clearly, but we have uh, different uh, phenolic compounds that are shown here. For example, we have the hydrocinamic acid, the flavonoids, the glycosides, as well as the cumulus, and all these compounds are associated with um, the fruits of Ola Europea. Next slide. So table one and two here is showing you the phenolic compounds that were able to bind to COX-1 and COX-2. So for, for table one, we are seeing a phenolic acid ester which is uh, exhibiting the highest binding affinity of negative 5.087 and this is owing to the structure of this uh, compound which is characterized by a long uh, unsaturated chain and this structure resembles the substrate of the cyclooxygenase one enzyme which is, um, which is uh, archidonic acid like I was saying. So it is followed by um, the second phenolic compound which is Lipstroside derivative one, which is uh, exhibiting the highest binding affinity of negative 48.22. So for table two, we are seeing Lipstroside derivative two exhibiting the highest binding affinity of negative 4.9 of negative 49.54, which is um, uh, different from what we observed in uh, table one. So one thing that was noted um, uh, when they were comparing this table is that there are different classes, there are different uh, subclasses of phenolic compounds that were able to bind to the uh, active site of cyclooxygenase 2 than to the active site of cyclooxygenase 1. So overall, the docking results show or demonstrated that the, phen the phenolic acid compounds were able to bind to both COX-1 and COX-2 with a marginally high, high binding affinity, meaning that all these phenolic compounds they were able to bind to the active site of both COX-1 and COX-2. Next slide. So figure four here is showing you the average leaf energies of different phenolic acid subclasses due to both COX-1 and COX-2. So as you can see, the blue color is showing you the phenolic compounds that were able to bind to the active side of COX-1, whereas the red color is showing you the phenolic compounds that were able to bind to the active side of COX-2. So here they are saying that uh, a, a negative average lead energy shows a strong binding between the ligands or between the uh, phenolic acid compounds with the, uh, with the target protein. For example, here we have the first compound which is the phenolic fatty acid uh, ester, and it is exhibiting the, the average leak energy of around 48 or 49 kilocalories per mole. So this shows that these um, compounds from this uh, subclass of phenols were able to bind strongly to the active side of COX-1. But when we go to, for example, the glass cumarins, 
it is showing you uh, the highest average energy of around 30, 30, 30 something kilocalories per mole. So this means that the Kumarins were able to bind to the active side of both COX-1 and COX-2, but not strongly as the phenolic fatty acid disturbs. So figure five here is showing you the interactions of the ligands with the target proteins and the ligands were able to interact with the, with the target protein through different interactions. For example, um, we have the hydrogen bond interactions which are indicated by the papal arrow. We also have the pi patient interactions and they are indicated by the red, or the, the red arrow and also the pi, pi stacking interactions and they are indicated by the green arrow. So all these interactions, they contribute to the stability of protein ligand interaction as well as to the specificity of the ligand binding to the binding pocket of the target enzymes. So figure 5 here is showing you, actually it is representing a uh, per-residue uh, energy decomposition analysis. So this analysis is based on the fact that we want to know the specific residues that contribute to the binding of the ligand to the active site of both COX-1 and COX-2. So, uh, panel A or figure A, I mean uh, graph A is showing you the specific residues that contribute to the binding of only phenolic compounds to COX-1, whereas figure, I mean panel B is showing you the specific residues that contribute to the binding of the ligands to cyclooxygenase 2. So within these graphs, there are ranges that are indicating the favorable as well as the unfavorable interactions. For example, a more negative energy contribution shows the favorable interactions and we are um, visual, we are seeing a more negative energy contribution by the, um, by the lower panel here and the specific residues that contribute to the favorable interactions are valine 116 as well as alanine 527 and when we go to uh, figure B we can also see the same residues, valine 116 and alanine 527, meaning that these specific residues were able to contribute to the binding of ligands in uh, the target enzyme, both uh, COX-1 and COX-2. On the other hand, the upper panel is showing you the specific residues that are forming unfavorable interactions and we are seeing arginine at position 120, we are also seeing 7,530. More surprisingly, uh, we are seeing arginine both on COX-1 as well as in COX-2, meaning that this arginine was able to form unfavorable interaction for the ligands in both COX-1 and COX-2. And this is due to a concept known as steric hindrance, which is a physical obstruction of the uh, molecular interaction, meaning that the ligand is restricted to bind to the binding pocket of cyclooxygenase enzymes due to the molecular or the, the shape of the, I mean the shape of these uh, residues. So again, this figure is showing you the residue contribution in kilo joules per mole to the binding of olive uh, ligands to both COX-1 and COX-2. So ABC is showing you the ligands that were bound to uh, cyclooxygenase 1, whereas uh, DEF is showing you the ligands that were uh, bound to cyclooxygenase 2. So the residues that are colored so the residues are colored according to the um, machine. This uh, study was able to use computational tools in order to investigate the potential of polyphenolic compounds as cyclooxygenase inhibitors. And the study was able to identify the polyphenolic compounds that um, exhibited highest binding affinity to both enzymes, highlighting their potential to be used as um, anti-inflammatory drugs. So part two of the study will further elucidate or investigate their mechanism of action 
and they are the Tutsi Quintessia for anti-inflammatory conditions. Thank you. It, um, it influences the microenvironment of the protein, and when that happens, the interaction between the ligand and the protein might be disturbed. That's why they are saying that there is a concept of steric inhindrance, yeah. because the side chain of RGNN is going to influence the ligand to bind optimally to the binding target of that protein. Yeah. That's why these two specific residues were contributing unfavorably to the interactions between the ligand and the protein. Yeah, so you see that what we just explained now. Can you imagine arginine how it looks like? So my, my question specifically is to do with you imagining amino acids in the, in the space like arginine, like serine. There's something that makes them favorable to interact with the ligand. But you can't have the same with alanine and, uh, and valine. So hence I was asking, do you understand what type of interaction? Because remember you talk about pi interaction, pi pi interaction, and all those things. Yes. Arginine can do that, because arginine is positively charged. So that means it can do pi catch ion interaction. But what about alanine? Alanine is just CH3. What type of interaction would it engage on? Valine is the same thing. It's just CH, CH3, CH3, bottom up. What, what would, type of interaction would that be? So, so my question is, is specifically to remind you to say, when you speak of this language, you need to have in mind the amino acids, all amino acids in your mind. It's, oh, wow, this one can do pi pi interaction. This one can do, and I talk about the answer to that question I was asking is specifically hydrophobic interaction. Because they're more on board. So that they will, they will do a complete interaction. Yeah. But you see, people who do this type of work, when they want to abolish, when they want to see what, whether if arginine is working, right? they remove arginine and put alanine there. In most cases, they use two analysis. They put either glycine or arginine because they regard them as non interacting uh, amino acids. Yes. But here in your work, they show that they are actually functional. Yes. So you and that's true, sir, because just to take you through this, uh, this slide. So, you saw the, the, uh, the residues that are indicated by green. Yeah. So, this green color is indicating you the hydrophobic residues. Yes. Meaning that they contribute to hydrophobic interactions. Yeah. And those specific residues that you were talking about were part of uh, the interaction or the residues that you are seeing here. Exactly that. So that's what I wanted you to say. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs> Any other question? Okay. I also want to, to remind all of you that the reason why we signed this paper prior to this meeting is for all of you to be able to engage with the speaker. When you have read the paper, for you to just listen to what she's saying, you are not going to be able to pick things quickly. So you need to have engaged with the paper so that you can engage with her too. And also that she is not here to answer all your questions. Because we need to have engaged with the paper, okay? This is not Tommy's work. And I'm saying this even for the future journals. You pick up the paper, you read, you give it to us, you also read, you engage the paper. We should be able to pick flaws in that paper. You should be able to say, but these guys didn't do it right. It's published, but they didn't do it right because I saw one, two, three, that is not right. Okay? Because when you go to publish your own work, you'll be able to pick those things and correct them yourself. For instance, Tommy might want to publish in the same journal that she got this paper from. Then she, when she's reading this paper, she knows what they require, the structure of the paper and those sort of things. That's why we are here to help each other through those those kind of things, rather than to you know you know push you to me a little. Because if we do that, no one will want to do a presentation at the general thing. Because we might be scared that we will be embarrassed and all those kind of things. So we help each other. We read the paper and then we sort of interrogate the paper 
but then Tommy will have to lead. You will have to lead when you pick the paper. Okay? Anybody who read this paper have some sort of concern, a compliment, a question to Tommy, to me, to everyone else. Let's take a very bit from the chapter. I just want to add on what he said. Uh, a story that when I was still a student, we had a very small group, I think it was six, seven students. So we used to do a meeting like this. One student came to present the paper like Utomi did. But Prof. Madalo was asking about Ajinei Nuvali. You need to know that. You're, you're not doing docking, but you're working with proteins. Our messages are there in those proteins you're working with. Where is Madalo? What were you saying about methyl transferase or that taste here? You're talking about enzymes. So this is the type of work that you need to do. So you can understand your own work from someone else's work, translate it to yours. It's important that we all read uh, those kind of papers. Um, yeah, okay. Do you want to ask us questions? Do you don't have a question for you? Can I do that? Yeah, you can do that. Okay, because I was presenting on COX-1 and COX-2, what is the difference between COX-1 and COX-2? Yes. I can't answer that because... The wrong person to answer. She told me no. Coxonics. Permanent continual protein prostaglandins. It's what? It's involving continual prostaglandins. And Cox2 is produced as a result of information. It's a result of information. Even if it's still not cost free then you have to But remember, both these enzymes are producing the prostaglandins. But the prostaglandins are playing different functions. So basically, uh, COX-1 is responsible for the production of prostaglandins that are implicated in various physiological functions. For example, the maintenance of homeostasis in the body, as well as the maintenance of renal function, which is the ability of the kidney to remove waste. On the other hand, COX-2 is inducible, meaning that it is not always produced. It can only be produced in response to red stimuli, for example, during pain, during inflammation, during fever. That's where it is going to be induced and then it will be produced. <laughs> <laughs> Is this physiology? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, to me, in your, your own way, because I've read your abstract uh, previously, you you are going to be looking for, is it glucosides? More? Because I see the class of compounds here in this paper. Since we're talking olive oil, it's not the same as the work you are doing. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's a different class. But yes. glucosides are also, I think they're sort of number two in the strongest binding in this. Can we relate this to your work? Uh, we talk glucosides. Are these glucosides that you looked at last year? No. So last year when I was uh, doing a similar study like this, the compounds that I found to exhibit the highest binding affinity were the flavonoids. They were the ones that were able to inhibit or that we predicted that they were able to inhibit the activity of cyclooxygenase enzymes. But in this case it's different because we are talking about a different plant species. It's not seen. So that's why you are seeing the glycoside may be exhibiting the highest binding affinity and not the glycol. I mean not the flavonoids. Just like I observed in my study. Maybe I should ask for phenolic esters. What, what do they do? Uh, what is the issue? Because I saw them here in this paper. So, what happens is that uh, the phenolics themselves they are acids. So, in order for them to be stored in a human body or transported to different organisms, they need to be esterified with different things. They can be esterified with themselves, so then you have chain of them around or they can be esterified to organic acids. Like for instance, the most famous ones that we work on is chlorogenic acids. Those chlorogenic acids are, are esters of the phenolic acid and an organic acid. But remember the ester bond, it needs to be formed between a carboxylic acid and, a, and a, an alcohol. 
So the other organic acid brings the alcohol, this one brings the acid, then the yeast are fine. But the argument is that sometimes you find an ester with the sugar, and then you find a phenolic glycoside. So that bond is also an ester bond, even though sometimes you find an ether bond between a, a, a phenolic and the and the and the sugar. So what happens is that we argued with uh, Professor Kabanda that these molecules, when they are transported or when the plants mix them, it mixes them with the glycoside so that they can remain in solution. But once you inject them in your gut here, there is an ester ester enzymes that breaks the bond between the acid and the whatever that is conjugated to it. It is only when it is a free acid that it functions better. But I've seen in most cases, like even with my students, when we do cooking work, we do it with the presence of the glycoside. But the argument is that once you eat it, you will never find it with the sugar anymore. The hysteresis breaks the, 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 the bond. So at, at CSIR, there was a, a, a guy called Chamush, Racha Moshe, he's, he's now in, with DSI. He used to work with enzymes that are responsible to break the esters because for drug discovery, drug uh, delivery, you need to put it together with an esterase and this one so that when they get to a target, the esterase will break the bond between the acid and the whatever that is esterized with so that it can become functional. In most cases, when you do this type of, of doping, you are encouraged to remove the sugar first and do it without the, the, the sugar so that um, you, you, you only look at the active side when the sugar doesn't really inhibit the protein it's there just to transport and store but when we are doing docking with the sugar the sugar will find a place yeah it will find a place yes. and that might be not so true as well yeah so then you must do both you must do it with the sugar and without the sugar because what is an ester? It's for storage and transportation. So there's a paper I can give it to you, you will see that once there's actually nice, nice uh, for flavonoids for instance, they say flavonoids when they get into the body, the sugars are removed, only the egg glycon goes and do the work. So the sugars are there for the host to store and transport. Because remember, these, these plants or leaves, that they don't even know that we're eating their, their compounds. So that means they didn't make these compounds for us to eat them. But it's through core evolution, we have evolved with them so that we have enzymes that can process the, the stuff from the plant and we utilize them for our well-being. But the, 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 the best way is to do it with the sugar and with the sugar removed. So can we, some of our hair studies say she should at least try to find esterase first, just to prove to us that esterase will be able to break this. Yeah, but esterase... Esterases I've heard from Dr. Klo, they are very promiscuous. They are not selective. Even if you give it any ligand, they'll bind it. As long as it is an ester bond, as long as they recognize that ester bond, they recognize it's just the rate at which they break apparently is different. They prefer certain type of classes, but they break everything. So that's the sad part about like uh, esterases. One example of such is like this. You know? Um, in plants, you see the, the leaves, the, that shiny material on the leaf. That thing is called a cuticle. It's also made, it's, it's an ester of phenolic acids. And, and, and then when the bacteria sits or the fungus sits on top of, of it, it produces a, an enzyme called lipase or ketinase. And that ketinase is an esterase. It breaks that layer so that it can get into the leaf. So people thought initially that there's just specialized enzymes that do that. So if you take any esterase and you just drop it on top of the leaf, that's an assay they do to see whether it will break the ester. They drop it on top of the leaf, it breaks open that shiny material. So they're very, very not specific, but it would be another good idea to, to, to show that it is binding them and it will, it will, this thing will be, will be broken. But uh, they're very not specific to what they do. Any ester they will break it. I have a question with the first one. What, what, what did you drop there in the first one? <coughs> so we dropped the uh, ole, ole tyrosol to COX-1. It's ole acid, right? Eh? Yes. So uh, that's quite interesting because um, um, do you know why ole, do you guys know why ole oil is expensive than corona oil? 
Do you know? Really? <laughs> uh, so olive oil is a very interesting plant in the sense that it produces those compounds there. Uh, just my, I can't see it very well. So these are called, you might have heard about them. So in, us, in East Africa, when a child is born, they feed them olive oil. Even in Italy, Mediterranean countries like Pakistan, not Pakistan, Palestine, Israel, those countries, they, 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 they farm olives. So they feed their kids olive oil as a, as a constant medication. But they also do something very peculiar, which I've seen. They also, you can ask maybe the people from Cameroon to ask they also boil a head of a fish. Um, if, they, if they can't afford olive oil, they, they boil it and you know it produces oils. Right? Mm -hmm. They take the water of that oil that comes from the, from the head of the fish and they feed the kids with a spoon. Because that oil, plus this oil of olive oil, they have um, uh, these prostaglandins that she's talking about. They come from a specialized uh, type of fatty acids called omega fatty acids. Have you seen them? They are solid clicks. Sometimes you find omega-3, omega-6, omega-9. What is happening with omega fatty acids is that you read the fatty acid from the carboxylic acid and you get a chain, like 1 to 20, I think I told you in second year. But when you read the omega fatty acid, you read them from the back. 1, 2, 3. If you read the double bond, that's omega-3. If you read 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it's omega-6. 1, 2, 3, 4, until 9. From the back, it's omega-9. When those proteins enter your body from, 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 from this olive oil, they change the structure. They, normally they, they are made as trans cis. Right? They change the structure and they bend. When they bend, they go a spontaneous reaction where they, 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 they don't only bend but they form covalent bond within itself. Those covalent bonded fatty acids, they make this molecule called prostaglandins. And prostaglandins are important for brain development. So that's why these people feed their kids these, these oils. Because apparently, when you have a lot of prostaglandins, remember you said they, are, they control inflammation. So when you are, I mean, when you are, your body is less inflamed and your brain is less inflamed, you develop your brain very quickly. And then that makes you clever. So that's why they feed their kids that thing. And you can see there's, there's, there's a group of people like these brilliant mathematicians. If you ask their, their parents what they did, they will tell them that this kid was fed uh, olive oil from the first uh, year of their life. How much was olive oil? It's too late. Too late. <laughs> it's too late. Yeah. 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 They also say that any diet that is sublimited supplemented with this olive oil, uh, it can be able to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. Yes, because they, they, they have unsaturated fatty acids. Remember the, the cardiovascular disease is that you have saturated fatty acids, like, a, like it's the difference between butter and margarine. The other one melts, the other one doesn't melt. Yeah. So it's because the other one has saturated fatty acids, the other one has unsaturated fatty acids. So the fact that you are eating unsaturated, like, like cow, like cow uh, fats, in Tibetan we say Jiakamba, right? if you leave it, you know, that happens inside your arteries. If you are eating a lot of uh, beef, that beef is going to build up, build up in your arteries. One day, heart attack. Why? Because your blood, your blood vessels cannot transport blood anymore. It's filled with those things. But if you eat olive oil because it's, it's uh, unsaturated, the fatty acids are fluidic. Being fluidic, they can't build up and form another layer inside your arteries. And you don't get cardiovascular disease. So in Italy, they say it's very rare that we find someone dying from a heart disease because they eat olive oil in everything. Whatever they eat, they pour olive oil on top. Whatever they do, it's just olive oil. Because they plant only olive oil and that's what they eat. Okay. Uh, you said all the alternative strategies have been de developed because one for about conventional drugs are long term effects. Yes. So I wanted to know the use of the use of olive compounds, for example, uh, don't they have long term effects? Because I know one compound that is called 
all your Kanta yeah, yeah. We decided to have similar effects to Lance Yeah. So, this, What's the question? Yeah, it's a question. Repeat it. So, it's saying that I carry they are developing alternative uh, strategies for the development of uh, uh, drugs that can cure different diseases. So he's saying that it was reported that there is a certain compound known as oleocanthal, which has similar effects as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So if it happens that this compound is found within the olive or within this olive oil, when we consume them, are we not going to suffer from the side effects that people are suffering from when they consume those non-steroidal and inflammatory drugs? Mm. But according to my understanding, I think maybe they wanted to just demonstrate that uh, the compounds found within this olive oil, they have the ability to do what? To inhibit the activity of cyclooxygenase, right? Mm. Yeah, that's what I think. So how would they avoid the side effects associated with all your comfort, for example? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if there's something negative about the paper, we can tell you. Something that they didn't look at, maybe. Uh, Rose? Okay, I, I also, who said that COX-1 is, I don't know if, okay, it's a suggestion actually, COX-1 is non-induced and COX-2 is induced. Mm -hmm. And then I think you mentioned something, even the article said it, about 60% similarities when we lost them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was saying that, um, she said that uh, COX-1 is um, non inducible then COX-2 is inducible and also she talked about something like 60% but I think 63% similarities in the article and then they spoke about um, a software that was last at the but then it was not shown in the article and also I don't know if it can relate but there's why you've shown the amino acid residues that they they are interacting when a protein uh, ligand binding. Maybe if they could have shown the last stage uh, the similarity and the differences, you could have seen something different that can induce the COX2 that is not able to induce COX1. I'm not sure if I get your question clearly, but uh, according to what they said, so they used homology modeling when they were uh, building the structure of human COX-1, right? And when they were doing that, they found another uh, structure, which is known as ovine ortholog. So they found and they used this structure as a template meaning that whenever they were building the structure of human COX-1, they were uh, looking at this uh, reference or the template structure. And as such, they found that there was 93% sequence similarity between the template and the structure of human COX-1. That's why they ended up using uh, homology modeling and not homology modeling for COX-2 because there was no sequence similarity between the template and human COX-2, you understand? But they also say that COX-1 and COX-2, they share similar uh, characteristics with 63% uh, sequence similarity like you mentioned, right? So yeah, they just wanted to demonstrate that these two enzymes are very similar with that, percent, with that uh, sequence percentage, but they perform different roles. I'm not sure if I'm saying correctly. Okay, I get what you're saying, but what I'm saying is that if you're going to do the similar studies that you do, a little bit better to include the sequencing, but even if it's similar, even if it's not similar. So we can see the sequence that is different from one, mm -hmm. from the other one. But can I clear why, probably why they didn't show you? When you go to a database, it's a bit late in this type of field 
to be showing things as a result, which is a very good one. You don't want to be saying this is my work. You know, anyone can go to the database and find this. So that's why you see even the homology structure that is there. It's even put right there in the introduction and because it's not really their work. If somebody crystallized this, sent to the database, they, they, their sequences are there, you can find it. If you pull out, um, what is that software that, if you put a structure of that 3D structure into that software, it's a software also I have You can pull out a sequence, you don't even have to ask it from the authors. But that's it's not yours, you know, somebody did that. So you don't want to be showing all these things that uh, belong to other people without permission, it might be unethical. So if you mention it and reference it, good. But like you suggested for a study, which is not a paper, it's a new dissertation, she can show that as long as she does um, proper citing. Correct? Okay. Any other question? Uh, okay. um, Reminded that we're going to be in the lab after this meeting. Yeah, but can we give a hand to both? Okay. Last time when we spoke about contribution, some people were not really up to it.